Next we have Mr. Dennis Block. Again, Dennis is a vast storehouse of knowledge when it comes to tenant evictions. When it, Dennis spent a long time with, uh, in LA City rent control defending landlords and now that the entire state has come under uh, the death of, of rent control, if you will, as a large, Dennis comes with more than uh, three decades of his experience again within LA City which already had rent control to now work with landlords or that this is all new to you. So with that, I welcome now Mr. Dennis Block. So I do want to talk about the latest events dealing with uh, the pandemic and also I will then move on to uh, the issues dealing with statewide rent control and how it affects landlords. As a general proposition, uh, I think that as bad as this pandemic is, I think it's going to be short-lived. I think that we'll see within a month or two, it'll be business as usual. So the lessons that you're gonna learn from this seminar will certainly be true. And I'm here to weed you through that path and also to stop a lot of misinformation. So let's, uh, let's turn our attentions right now to the issues that there is a moratorium on all evictions and you can't file one single lawsuit. That is totally false. Anybody in the state of California can file any eviction that they want. There is no impediment, there is no law that stops you. If you have a tenant that is not paying you rent right now, I encourage you to serve a three-day notice and commence an eviction. There is no reason to wait. Now, there have been some municipalities, not the state, but there has been some municipalities that have passed some orders dealing with the issue of this virus, this pandemic. In Los Angeles, for example, what it states is that if you lost your job or as a result of this virus that you are now in violation of your rental agreement, that that can be a defense to a non-payment of rent case. It's only for non-payment of rent cases. So if you have a tenant who's creating a nuisance, this order would have nothing to do with you. Of course you'd have the right to go forward and bring forth an eviction. But if you have a tenant who legitimately lost his job due to the pandemic and now is telling you that he can't pay the rent, that can be a defense. But let's think about this logically. If you have a tenant who didn't pay the rent on March 1st, clearly that has nothing to do with the pandemic, with uh, uh, the coronavirus. It has nothing to do with it. Uh, no one lost their job on March 1st, and yet landlords are believing that they cannot bring forth an eviction on the basis that there is some order that prevents them. The order in Los Angeles specifically states that it can be used as a defense. Now, come April 1st, there can be a situation legitimately where a tenant who was a, in, a, in a restaurant, working in a restaurant, lost his job. I can see it at that situation and we're going to be serving special notices to these tenants with our three-day notice to pay rent or quit, asking them for proof. They have to show proof. So we're having a lot of tenants who call our clients, for example, and who are stating, well, gee, I don't have to pay rent for the next two months. Nothing could be further from the truth. There has to be a specific relationship between the coronavirus and why you are violating the terms of your rental agreement. And again, it only is in reference to dealing with non-payment of rent. If there's any other violations under the rental agreement, that would have nothing to do and no order is there to in any way protect that tenant. So I encourage landlords, if your tenant owes you rents right now, what I would strongly recommend that you do is to serve a three-day notice and commence an eviction. There is no reason. Now, there has been some delays at the courts where the courts are not hearing trials until April 17th in Los Angeles, and it differs between the different counties. Some of the counties are at the end of this month. But again, there's nothing preventing us from filing lawsuits, 
prosecuting lawsuits and getting the matter close to a trial date, which would come up in mid-April. So once again, what we're dealing with is a lot of misinformation where I think government is going a little too far to protect tenants, which of course are not giving any rights to landlords. It's interesting where they, the thought is that they're going to suspend uh, the eviction cases, which of course is not exactly true, but there's no corresponding rights to landlords who are looking for their rents for their income, for them, for them to pay their own mortgage payments, for them to feed their own families. Nothing is stated about what protection goes to the landlord, but of course that's the society that we live in where certain segments of society are supposed to support other segments of society. So once again, with regard to this latest news that evictions are stayed and you can't file it, that is not true and I'm really encouraging all landlords, if you have a tenant who's doing something wrong, do not hesitate to bring forth an eviction case. Uh, our firm has been in existence now for 43 years. We have 20 attorneys all specializing in landlord-tenant law, and we never charge for a phone call. If you're looking at the, um, our logo, if that's on the screen now, our toll-free number is 1-800-77-EVICT. We do not charge for a phone call if you've got a quick question, and we're happy to answer your questions with regard to either these new developments or general questions dealing with landlord-tenant law. So now that I've finished that topic, what I was supposed to talk about before this upheaval is statewide rent control. And again, this is a very short-lived subject that we're living through now, and I predict that within the next month or two, lives will return to normal, and now we're dealing with our wonderful statewide rent control. So let's talk about that. When we're talking about uh, statewide rent control, uh, we have to understand that we had in the state of California, oh, about a year or so ago, we had something on the ballot called Proposition 10. Proposition 10 was to allow the spread of rent control. And the realty groups and the apartment associations and attorneys such as myself gave our time, gave our money. I was speaking up and down the uh, coast of California urging uh, voters not to vote for Proposition 10 so that we would have a situation where rent control could not spread. And I want you to know everybody did a great job. We defeated Proposition 10 so that rent control could not spread. In fact, we defeated it by a two-thirds to one-third margin. So I ask everybody out there, what the hell happened? If we defeated Proposition 10, why do we have statewide rent control? And the answer is very simple. Our legislators and our governor didn't care about our electorate of voters. They didn't care what the populace wanted, and they just voted it in anyway. So what I'm going to be talking about now is what rent control, statewide rent control is, what it applies to, what are the exceptions to it, and of course, since I am an attorney, how to easily get around statewide rent control. So let's first talk about the first point, and that is, this is somewhat of an unusual concept to gather, and that is, if your property is subject to a local rent control statute, then you are not subject to statewide rent control. So let me repeat. If I have a property that's located in Los Angeles, Santa Monica, an unincorporated area of LA County or Inglewood, Culver City, Glendale, if you're subject to a local rent control statute, then that statute controls and you are not part of statewide rent control. Now, there is an exception to that. Let's pretend you owned a building, an eight unit building in the city of Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, if your building was considered new construction, that is it was built after October 1st, 1978, 
then your building was exempt from rent control. So you were a savvy investor and you bought a building that was built, for example, in 1990, or you were a builder, so you developed a building in the year 2000, and it was located in the city of Los Angeles, and you did so for one reason only. You knew you were not going to be subject to rent control. Well, if you're not subject to a local rent control statute, now as of January 1st, 2020, your building is now subject to statewide rent control. So again, if your property was exempt from rent control because it was new construction, now you are subject to the statewide rent control. So once again, if your property is under LA rent control, Santa Monica, uh, uh, West Hollywood, any of those jurisdictions, you are not subject to statewide rent control. But if some, for some reason you were exempt from that, then you are now under statewide rent control. So let's talk about the fact that if you are under statewide rent control, there are some exemptions if you're under statewide rent control. If you have a certificate of occupancy that was issued within the last 15 years, you are now exempt from statewide rent control. So let's pretend that you are in the city of Redondo Beach, which never had rent control. And you have a building that was built in the year 2010. Well, that would indicate that you have a property where it was issued with a certificate of occupancy was issued within the last 15. You are exempt from rent control. But those sneaky politicians, when they created the law, did not give a specific date. For example, in Los Angeles, you are exempt from rent control if your property was built after October 1st, 1978. Anything beyond that, you are exempt from rent control. But the politicians, when they wrote this law, didn't give a specific date. What they said was anything where a certificate of occupancy was issued within the last 15 years. Now, I'm not so good in math, but I can tell you the following. Today is 2020, subtract 15 from that, and the year would be 2005. If you have a building that was built in 2005, you could say your property is not under rent control. But under this statute, next year it will be. So it doesn't matter when your building was built, if you own it long enough, your building will have been older than 15 years. So of course what happens in that situation is that why would builders want to develop property? At least, for example, in the past you thought, well gee, I'm building a building and it's after that date, so there's no chance I'll be under rent control. But right now, the way this statute is written, it doesn't matter. Your building, if you own it long enough, will find itself subject to statewide rent control. So that's an important point, and it's another reason why developers in this state should think otherwise in terms of going forward and building. Okay, other exemptions to statewide rent control would be single family homes, condominiums, and townhomes. If you have a single family home, a condominium, or a townhome, you are not subject to rent control. That means you can raise the rent to whatever level you like. It also means that uh, you can ask the tenant to move without reason if they're on a month-to-month -month tenancy. Now, of course, the politicians had to put in some exceptions, so let's talk about that. If your townhouse, condominium, or single family home was, is owned by a corporation or a real estate investment trust, a REIT, then you are now under statewide rent control. So let's pretend that your business model was to own homes in Manhattan Beach and you own six single family homes. Well, that would be exempt from rent control. You could go about your business, raise your rents to market level, and you could also, of course, uh, ask a tenant to move without cause. But if some lawyer gave you the great idea that you were gonna hold all those homes in the form of a corporation or a real estate investment trust, you are now pushed into statewide rent control. So it's very simple. If you have that as a situation, 
then what you want to do is you want to divest the corporation and put it into either an individual's name. It is permissible to put it into an LLC, a limited liability company, or into a family trust, a living trust, which a lot of people do. So once again, if you're single family home, condominiums, townhomes, you are exempt from rent control unless you hold it as a corporation or a real estate investment trust. Uh, then I would urge you immediately to get it out of that entity so that you will now be exempt from statewide rent control. Owner-occupied duplexes are also exempt from rent control. So if you have, an, uh, for example, a duplex that's Ocean View, and you live in one of the units and you have a tenant in the other unit who you've never raised the rent, so the rent is $642. In that situation, you'd be able to raise the rent to market level because owner-occupied duplexes are exempt. So I always come up with this example where both of your units in Redondo Beach are registered, excuse me, are occupied, one, of course, just moved in, so he's paying $4,500 per month. And then, of course, you have the other tenant who's lived there forever, so his rent is $642. Now, you happen to be living yourself in a palatial mansion in Beverly Hills. And then what happens is your tenant who's paying you $4,500 decides that he is going to vacate. Most people would think, gee, I've got a great idea. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move from my house in Beverly Hills. I'm going to move to that duplex. Now it's an owner-occupied duplex, and now I can now raise that rent on that tenant who's paying $642. But the answer is no. You can't do that. The way the law is written is that you had to have occupied that property prior to the initiation of the other tenancy. So unless you were there first, moving into the vacant unit doesn't help you. However, if you were there when that other tenant first moved in, then you are allowed to raise the rent to market level. It is an exception to the statewide rent control statute. Now, what we need to do is to understand that there are going to be certain requirements that the states need to put in with regard to your rental agreements or notices to the tenant. This is a requirement that's going to come avail as of July 1st, 2020. So you either have to have this as part of your rental agreement, we have it as an addendum, or a notice that must be served on each tenant who's already in possession of the premises. So let's move over there. This is a, a shot from my website. My website is evict123.com. The requirements under the state law, state rent control, is somewhat difficult to comprehend, but I've tried to make it as simple as possible. So if you go to my website, evict123.com, you're going to see I have it split in two separate categories. And that is where your property is not subject to rent control or where your property is subject to statewide rent control. So let's take the first one. Let's pretend that you have a single family home, a condominium or a town home, or let's pretend that your property was built within the last 15 years. So you are not subject to any rent control. Obviously, if you're subject to a local rent control jurisdiction, you don't apply. But let's pretend that you're subject to, uh, you're, you're exempt from any rent control. So I have a home, I have a condominium, or it's a newer building. In that situation, you need to, in every rental agreement that you initiate, you have to attach an addendum to that where you're giving the tenant certain knowledge that this property is not under rent control. So if you go to my website and if you can see that on the screen, it would be the top left one where you're going to click on that and you're going to attach that to every rental agreement. If in fact you already have a tenant in possession, 
Then you're going to use the one on the right side. That notice must be served to the tenant. He doesn't have to sign for it. It's just a notice to the tenant that he is going to uh, be notified that in fact your property is not subject to rent control. So either it's an addendum to the rental agreement or it's a notice that you're going to serve an existing. Now if you do a revised rental agreement with your tenant, you again want to have the addendum attached to that. Now, let's pretend that your property is subject to the statewide rent control ordinance. The same thing is true. You have to serve your tenant with a notice. Actually, I think I reversed it. It's the notice that's on the left side for existing tenants that, that you must serve this notice prior to July 1st, 2020, or on the right side, an addendum to that rental agreement. These are requirements that you must do. If you don't do that, you're not going to be able to raise the rent. You're not going to be able to evict tenants. And trust me, if you get into a court of law and these notices or this rental agreement is not complete, you are going to have a problem with that. Let's move on. So you're stuck with rent control. You never were before. You know nothing about it. What can you do? And the answer is, well, you're going to have to live with the reality that, for example, rent increases are only allowable once uh, in terms of a 5% annually plus the CPI. The CPI is the Consumer Price Index. It's basically the cost of living on a yearly basis. The statute deals with the month called April. So right now, you deal with the, what came out in April of 2019. That goes back to April 2018 to April 2019. The CPI was 2.9%. So since you're entitled to a 5% annual increase plus the CPI, you add 5% to 2.9, and the total increase that you are allowed for your properties today is 7.9%. Now, there has been a lot of discourse with regard to what the CPI is. Some people say in Los Angeles it's 3.3 and in Riverside it's 2.1. And people are stating that 2.9 is not an accurate figure. All you guys really have to know is very simple. I'm right and they're wrong. Because the way the statute was written, it's written on the basis of regions. What people are talking about when they talk about Los Angeles or Riverside are local jurisdictions. That's not the way the law was written. Even the author of the law, which is Assemblyman Chow, realized he made a, state, a mistake. He used the word regions. The West region covers all of California and Oregon. And for the rest, West region, it is 2.9% based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I'm going to go to that screen quickly and then I'll come back. If you can see that, that's the Western region. It's by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and it's 2.9 effective April of 2019. That will change, of course, when we uh, get to April of 2020. But right now, the CPI is 2.9. You're going to add that to uh, the 5% and you're entitled to a 7.9% rent increase. And that's effective as of March 15th, 2019. So if you haven't raised the rent and your property is subject to statewide rent control, you can immediately do a 7.9% rent increase. You would have to wait one year from that point before you then uh, give another rent increase. Now. This law became effective on April 1st. If you had done a 20% rent increase and that 20% rent increase became effective January 1st, 2019, you're fine because that rent increase was prior to March 15th, 2019. Even if you did a 20% rent increase, you'd still be entitled after March 15th to give another rent increase, which would be that 7.9%. But what about the landlords who didn't realize this law was coming and raised the rent 20% effective April 1st, 2019? 
If they did that, the issue is, would that be legal? And the answer is yes, it would be legal, but only through December of 2019. So if I did a 20% rent increase, which became effective April 1st, 2019, that is legal for April and May and June and all the way to December. But when December comes, excuse me, when January came, you had to tell your tenants that your rent was now being reduced from a 25% rent increase down to a 7.9. You'd have to, and if you've done this and you haven't given, if you haven't told the tenant and you've collected additional rent, you're under an obligation to give the rent back to the tenants. So tell the tenants that, hey, the most I could have charged you was 7.9, it was legal through December, but come January 1st, I have to inform you that your rent is going to be uh, lessened. Now, a lot of landlords tell me, but is there some sort of a state rent control board who's gonna be looking at this? You know, I did that 25% rent increase. Is there somebody gonna be knocking on my door? Is there somebody checking the rents? My tenant doesn't know. And the answer is there is no statewide rent control office. I know they have them in West Hollywood and Los Angeles and Santa Monica, but there's nothing for the state. So the landlords will ask me, well, should I just not say anything? I mean, the guy's happy, he's paying me the rent. And the answer is yes, you should, because it's like a ticking time bomb. Three, four years will come down and the guy will be at a cocktail party and talking to some lawyer and all of a sudden the subject will come up and then all of a sudden you'll find yourself embroiled in a lawsuit where you're gonna to have to disgorge all the extra money, they'll sue you for punitive damages, it's not worth it. And besides, remember, I told you that I have a way around all of this so we don't really have to worry. So for the landlords out there that have uh, charged too much rent where the rent was above that 7.9% figure, as of January, make sure that you inform your tenants and that you give it back to them. Now, you are entitled to do two rent increases per year as long as it does not exceed the 7.9%. So if you only did a 5% rent increase, which became effective April 1st, you would be duty bound to, or you can give them a, an additional 2.9% rent increase. Now I predicted, and I'm sure I'm right, that when they, if they instituted this rent control, what you would find is that rents would escalate and there'd be more evictions. And that's exactly what you're gonna see. That landlords who never raised the rent or who would only raise it 5% per year, now feel that under the onerous of the state telling them what to do, that they're going to be raising the rent every year to the maximum amount. And I'm encouraging landlords to do that as long as it's at market value. Don't get caught because you never know what the legislators will do next year. So if you have the right to raise the rent and it's going to bring you to market level, I'm encouraging every landlord to do so. Let's move on with our rent increases, okay? Anytime you have a rent control statute, you do need to have an issue of good cause to evict. They're gonna always put that in because if you had rent control without a required good cause to evict, then landlords, what they would do is merely serve a notice to quit on a month-to-month -month tenancy and then raise the rent to the next person. So, of course, they would have done that in this situation as well where you do need good cause to evict. But they did put something curious into the statewide rent control statute. And what they put in was that during the first year, you do not need to have your, uh, you do not need to have a reason to evict. So during the first year of the tenancy, you do not need to have a reason to evict. So I'm gonna read, visit that subject, but do remember, if you're renting out a unit in that first year, do not, uh, do not think that you have to have a reason. So if you don't like the tenant or you're just not getting along, you don't have to have a specific reason in the first year. This is only under, of course, statewide rent control. So we do know that we do need to have a reason to evict. What would those reasons be? 
Uh, of course, you can always evict the tenant for non-payment of rent, and that even includes right now because there is no such thing as a statewide or a local moratorium on evictions. If a tenant's not paying the rent, you can serve a three-day notice to pay rent or quit. Uh, obviously, uh, you can serve a three-day notice uh, as soon as the rent is delinquent. Rent is delinquent the day after it is due. So if rent is payable on the first, you have every right to serve a three-day notice on the second. If the tenant doesn't pay within the three days, then you have the absolute right to bring forth an unlawful detainer action. Now, there is an exception to that, and that is that if the rent due date falls on a Saturday, Sunday, or a legal holiday, then the tenant will get to the next business day to pay the rent, and you cannot serve a three-day notice to pay rent until the following day. Let me give you an example. If rent is payable on the first, and the first turns out to be a Saturday, then really the tenant's gonna get till Monday to pay the rent, and you can't serve a three-day notice until Tuesday. And if, God forbid, Monday was a holiday, then the tenant's going to get till Tuesday to pay the rent, and then uh, you can't serve the three-day notice until Wednesday. Now, people always ask me, but wait a second, there's that grace period, that five-day or three-day grace period, and the truth is there is no such thing as a grace period. A grace period is only when a late charge, kick, excuse me, is only when a late charge would kick in. So that has nothing to do with serving a three-day notice. So if you have that tenant, for example, who's paying $642 for an ocean view apartment and you're stuck under rent control, I would certainly serve a three-day notice immediately as soon as the rent is delinquent. And if the rent is not paid within the three days, you're gonna commence an eviction. And if that tenant comes to you with all the money gift wrapped on the fourth day, I would suggest to you that if this apartment is only going for $642, I would suggest not taking it because the tenant only had three days to pay the rent. There are other reasons to evict under statewide rent control, and that would be if there's a breach of the rental agreement. For example, uh, let's pretend that the rental agreement says no pets and our tenant brought in a small Shetland pony. In that situation, you would serve a notice to perform or quit, and if the tenant did not get rid of that pony within the three days, you would then have grounds to evict. By the way, all of our forms, notices to pay rent or quit, the notices that are required and rental agreements are all on my website. There is no charge. Once again, that's evict123.com. Other reasons that you can evict for basis of a breach under your rental agreement would be for extra people. They bring in extra persons that are in violation of the rental agreement. Sometimes the tenants will do an alteration. They'll put a satellite dish on the roof. Those would be all grounds that I would serve a notice to perform or quit, giving that tenant three days to remedy that breach. And if they do not, then you'd have the absolute right to bring forth an eviction. Other grounds for eviction under statewide rent control would be whether they're creating a nuisance, waste, criminal activity, or using the premises for an unlawful purpose. Let's go over those real quickly. Waste would be that you'd have a beautiful tree in the front of your apartment building and our friendly little tenant decided that this day he was gonna cut down the tree. That would be waste. Or maybe he just felt like he'd break out every window in the property. Again, that would be waste and that would be grounds to evict your tenant. Criminal activity. Let's pretend you have an entrepreneurial tenant and he decided that he would do a very, very small methamphetamine lab in the living room. If that was the case, you'd be able to, to immediately serve a three-day notice to quit for criminal activity and proceed forward with an eviction. If the tenant was using the premises for an unlawful purpose, that again would be grounds to evict. For example, we have some tenants where they're creating uh, basically a food distribution. They're creating tamales in their premises and they put them on the carts and then they go sell them in the street. They're using their kitchen as a commercial kitchen. And of course we have tremendous grease and grime and cockroaches and, 
and uh, use of water and it really becomes a serious problem for some of my clients, that would again be grounds for eviction. And of course, you can always evict a tenant if they're creating a nuisance. Screaming, yelling, loud playing of music, urinating out the windows, you have no idea what these people are doing. And on that basis, if that's the conduct, then you would have the right to evict. In that latter instance, you are going to need to have witnesses, that is, other tenants come to court. A lot of times that becomes a difficult proposition because tenants are afraid to come to court for retribution. Maybe they're going to get their car keyed. In that situation, we can always subpoena tenants to come to court in that unusual situation. But again, if you have conduct like that under the statewide rent control, you can. Uh, you can start an eviction based on that conduct. Let's take our attention back to that $642 Ocean View Redondo Beach apartment. And our little friendly entrepreneurial tenant is uh, putting it up on Airbnb and he's making $175 a day. In that situation, that would also be a ground for evicting because that would be assigning or subletting your units. You can also evict a tenant when they're failing to allow access to your property. And you can also evict a tenant if they've signed an agreement to vacate, like a cash for keys or a voluntary vacate agreement. These are all grounds for that you can evict the tenant. But these are all grounds when the tenant has done something wrong. What happens if your tenant is akin to Mother Teresa? pays her rent on time, doesn't even own a TV or a radio, her only source of entertainment is reading the Bible, and she turns the pages very softly. In fact, she's thinking about getting a Kindle so there'll be no noise at all. What do you do in that situation? Are there any grounds to evict? And the answer is yes. The state does allow reasons to evict based on no fault. That would be where you're having a family member move in, either that's yourself, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, your parents, or your grandparents, not your brother. If you want your brother to move in, you're gonna to have to put him on title so he's an owner. So once again, if you do want to evict the tenant, you have the right to do so under the state law by putting in yourself, spouse, children, grandchildren, parents or grandparents. You do have to pay relocation. The relocation, unlike in Los Angeles, which would be up to $21,200 in sanity, under state law, you only have to pay one month's rent. And that can either be given to the tenant directly or you can use it as a credit off of his last month's rent. So if you do want a family member to move in, even though the tenant has done nothing wrong, under the state statute, you have the right to do so. Also, that beautiful duplex that you have in Redondo Beach, if you decide that you want to demolish it and build six condominiums with subterranean parking, you would have the right to serve a notice to quit on each of those units. You pay one month's rent and then uh, you have the right to tear down the building and build a brand new building. That would be fine under statewide rent control. You also have an ability to evict the tenant if you have an illegal unit. Sometimes you buy a building that's eight units, but really only seven of them are legal. And you get a governmental order which is telling you to discontinue that use. You'd be able to evict the tenant by serving that notice on the tenant and paying one month's relocation. So these are all grounds to evict when you're uh, dealing with a no fault under statewide rent control. Moving along, ways to survive statewide rent control. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Whenever we rent out a unit, we normally, whether we're agents or whether we're doing it for ourselves or we're managers, we always do it under a one-year lease, correct? And the answer is no. You will never, if your property is subject to statewide rent control, ever raise your rent out a unit based on a one-year lease. You are never going to do that. Do you know why? And the answer is, remember what I told you towards the beginning of this discussion? 
And that is you do not need good cause to evict if the tenant has been there for less than a year. Well, if you rent it out on a one-year basis, that means that tenant can stay there forever. In fact, quite frankly, that tenant can stay there until your grandchildren have grandchildren. Because you're going to need good cause to evict, as, as stated by the statute. So, if you're going to rent out a unit that is subject to statewide rent control, what you need to do is rent it out either by a month-to-month -month tenancy or a six-month lease. This way, at the end of the lease, you can tell the tenant, hey, I don't need cause to evict. Now, I don't know why it is. But whenever you're renting out a unit and you have an applicant in front of you, they seem so damn nice. They don't care that the garbage disposal isn't working. They don't care that there's a crack in the window. They don't care that there's a little dust here and there. They're so apologetic and they're so nice to you and they just want to get into your unit. And then, once the agreement is signed, they become Attila the Hun. They're calling you every week. This is broken. That is broken. There's a crack in the wall plate. I see a spider. Yeah. There's an ant in my kitchen. Uh, is your uncle there too? And they'll keep going on and on. Every other tenant, they'll call you once a month. The garbage disposal's not working. You immediately go in and fix it. This one, we call these people malcontents. And they seem so nice coming in. But that's not what happened. So if you're under statewide rent control, where you're going to need good cause to evict, that's not going to be good cause that they're calling you a bunch of times and making your life miserable and being so disrespectful. But... If they're on a month-to-month -month or a six-month lease, you could tell them, you know what, your lease is coming up, I'm not renewing, because you don't need good cause to evict. So make sure that's one tip that I'm telling you with regard to statewide rent control, make sure you do not rent out your unit. Now, once the tenant's been there a year, you're stuck. Even they're on a month-to-month, -month, you're stuck. But at least you get to try them out for a year. You get to see how they are. Most tenants will show their true colors within that first year. And you have a chance of removing that tenant from the building without much trouble. Let's move on. Uh, the, I'm going to recommend that you also serve uh, rent increases every year because you don't know what the legislators will do to you. Make sure that you serve rent increases every year to the maximum amount as long as it doesn't exceed market value because otherwise you wouldn't be able to uh, rent out the property. I also recommend that you do a separate parking agreement. So if you're advertising a unit for $2,000 with parking, when the tenant gets there, have the rental agreement say that it's $1,990 and a separate parking agreement for $10. Two separate agreements. Your rental agreement will say no parking, but there's a separate rental agreement. Why am I separating it? Because the parking agreement is considered commercial and it doesn't fall under rent control. So you will have more power with that tenant to either increase the rent on the parking as much as you like or even remove the parking. So it gives the landlord much more power. So again, you're going to rent out units for less than one year you're going to serve rent increases every year and do a separate parking agreement. The last thing I'm going to tell you, which is the trick that's going to save everybody under statewide rent control, and that is you are allowed to evict any tenant that you like as long as you're going to do substantial renovation. If you're going to do substantial renovation, which requires remodeling, replacement, or modification of any structural, electrical, or plumbing, or mechanical system, you have the right to evict the tenant. If you've got rent that is very low, trust me, you're going to have to renovate that unit anyway. So you're going to do substantial renovation. You're going to pay this tenant one month's rent, serve him with a notice to quit that my firm can help you with. The work has to require a building permit, like an electrical or a plumbing permit, and has to take longer than 30 days to complete. If that's the case, then you can easily evict the tenant. So basically, anytime you need a tenant evicted, 
As long as you're going to remodel the kitchen or the bathroom, it's a simple way of removing that tenant, do the renovation, and now you're able to raise the rent to market level. I want to thank everybody. Anybody has any further information, you can always call me at my office. I have a toll-free number, 1-800-77-EVICT. And I want to thank Chris, Gore, uh, Chris for allowing me to do this. Thank you.